your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. Good morning, Living Hope. Welcome. Lord, we love you, and we give you praise this morning. We welcome you. Receive our offering. Thank you, Lord, for all the things you've done for us this week. I pray that somehow we have shown you love that we lived in a way that represented you well and glorified your name. Please receive our offering of worship. Be in your spoken word. Hear our prayers today as we lift you up. We give you praise and glory, for there is none like you, and we love you. Amen. Job 19, verses 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand up on the earth, And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Psalm 63, verse 2 through 4. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. This life that you give Jesus Your loving kindness Is life that's changing my heart Drawing me
love is better than life, Lord. We do know it well. Thank you. Psalm 111, verses 3 through 5. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. For he has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He's already provided everything you need. He's already provided every promise. Just ask it in his name, everything you need, he's already provided. Every promise you can claim, just ask it in his name. Everything you need, he's already provided. verses 3 and 4. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Great is thy faithfulness, Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness great is 
for being faithful, Lord. Thank you. Psalm 18, verses 30 and 31. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? At who is a rock except our God? Lifter of 
about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. Thou, oh Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter. Of my head. Hallelujah. 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 You're the the lifter of our heads, O Lord. You are amazing. We give you praise today. Be lifted up, our God, our Father, friend, Savior, Lord. Be lifted up and glorified today. May your word spread across the universe today and lives be changed. Be lifted up, O God. Let us live our lives in a way that glorifies you, that the world will know that you are still God. You are still in control of the universe. There is none like you. At your word, every knee will bow. We praise your name. We give you glory. We love you. In the name of your son who died for us and was rose again that we might rise to live with him and with you. We give you praise. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. And good morning, Living Hope. God bless you. <laughs> Thou, O Lord, are a shield about me. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful truth to know that when you're in Christ, the Lord watches over us. He protects us. He, he shields us as we commit ourselves to follow him. Praise God. Praise God for such a truth. You know, today's a really exciting day. We're going to open the book today and we're going to look at a new epistle, a new letter. We finished Philippians last week, and today we, <clears throat> we're, excuse me, we're going to launch on an adventure into the book of Galatians. Praise God for Galatians. This is a letter that's going to impact us all tremendously in our understanding of who God is and how God saves people, how he saved us, and how we are to walk in his power. I'm very excited about it. I hope you'll get something out of it too. This morning, though, before we begin Galatians, I want us to um, just go through a couple of things as we usually do. Please keep praying, church. God is moving. Um, we need to understand exactly how God wants us to react to the things that are before us, and we need to ask the Lord for his wisdom and discernment and discretion. Please pray about this land with me. Pray about the effectiveness in this ministry. This land is just to the east of 225 in Colfax, right across the highway from the Anschutz Medical Center, a prime location in the Aurora region. And we're in a situation where we really need God's guidance. So please pray. Pray for this church. Pray for this ministry, not just about the land, but about us being able to follow the Lord and do what he wants us to do. And if you do want to financially support our ministry here at Living Hope Community Church, you can donate online. There's a PayPal link below that will take you to that electronic donation site. 
You can also donate by mail should you choose. There's a P.O. box. If you send your uh, offering to that P.O. box, um, we'll be greatly blessed by you. We thank you for it in advance as God leads you. Again, we're not trying to take any funding away from the church you may be going to, assuming you're not going to Living Hope already. Uh, but if you do feel God's prompting to support this ministry, we would be most grateful to God and to you as well. So now, it's time to open the book of Galatians and get started. Before we begin, though, let me pray for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are our Father. You care for us. You guide us. You watch over us. You are a shield about us. And Lord, as we bow before you this morning, we ask you for your strength, your understanding, your wisdom, and your power to help us truly grab what you're teaching us in the book of Galatians, not just today, but as we go through the entire letter. God, please help us. Help us not only understand, but help us have the courage to live according to what your word decrees, that we might be faithful, that we might be obedient before you. Lord, I pray for the one who doesn't know you. I pray as they understand your calling, understand what your word says, understand that Jesus is the Christ, that, that you'll open their eyes and that you'll bring them to a place of faith, that they, they might believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Glorify your name in this time. Demonstrate your strength through human weakness. And God, we want to say one more time, we love you. And it is our heart's desire to demonstrate our love for you by obeying you. Have mercy on us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, church, on to Galatians we go. Now, this is a phenomenal book, and let me just start off this way. If you think about the religions of the world, uh, all the religions of the world save one, the goal of religion is and has always been, how do I get that superpower that I know is there, however I identify it, the power of the universe, uh, the power of the light, the, however I identify God, whatever I think he may be, how do I appease him? How do I become somebody that is in his favor instead of uh, in his wrath, going to experience his judgment. Religion is based on this question, and, and rightfully so. Our inner, uh, our inner being tells us there is a God. And we're told in Romans 1 that just to look at the creation, everybody knows somewhere deep inside that God exists. Yeah, the atheists will try to explain him away, but that takes more faith than believing in God, if you really think about that. In the end, we are human beings that know there is a, a superpower, God himself. Yet, the religious quest is how do, how do we become right with him so that we do experience his blessing instead of his curse. Now, many religions have tried to answer that question through works, through becoming a good person, through being somebody that um, is trying his or her hardest to be acceptable to God. Okay, we don't hurt anybody, we tell ourselves. We, we try to do the right thing in whatever situation we come into. Or when you think about works, some religions will tell you, oh, you know, you need to pray through these beads. You need to, to walk up these steps and kiss every step and walk up on your knees if you want to be good enough for God. Some some would say, oh, well, you need to flagellate yourself with whips and make yourself bleed so that you can punish yourself and, and be mean to your flesh so that God will look upon you with favor. Other religions would tell you, well, you have to go be quiet. You just have to meditate. You have to think about your being and oneness. You have to do your best to appease the spirit world through your meditative state. Some people would say, oh, well, you have to go wash in this river at a certain time of year during a certain festival. If you go wash in the river at this time, you'll be 
on your way to being spiritually enlightened and you'll be on your way to being okay. I mean, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? That there are all kinds of attempts all throughout history for mankind to become acceptable to God, to pursue religion. Some people get tired of that. They say, let's just get rid of religion altogether. But yet and still, the heart of every individual can look at creation and understand that God is, as is described to us so well in Romans 1. We know he's there, but how do you become right with him? This is a question that's going to be answered in the book of Galatians, and it's going to be answered with force. Why? Because the Galatian church has gotten off track. The Galatian church has moved away from faith in Jesus Christ. They have moved into how can we do the best works we can do to be acceptable to God. Many, many people are bound by the law. And they consider themselves working hard to become good enough for God. But the reality of the spiritual life as described in the Bible is that none of us can be good enough for God in our own strength. None of us have the capacity to do enough good to negate the evil that controls us in our sinful nature. We're told we are slaves to sin without being in Christ. We are we are unredeemed. We are not going to be able to escape the wrath of God through our own effort. This is the, the point Scripture keeps pushing to us. And this is what Galatians really centers and focuses on. The idea of how does salvation occur? It's the most critical question you and I have to answer. Because if you think that God is going to receive you because you're a good person... You're going to be in for a rude awakening according to what Scripture declares. Now, if you think you have the, the capacity to impact God's opinion and you can tell God what he should do and God's going to listen to you, even though he's told us what he wants, he's going to listen to you, tell him about it, what a good person you are, uh, you got to understand you're, you're going to be at a judgment throne before a holy God, a perfect God, a God that doesn't plea bargain because a God, the God knows all the truth. He, he's not going to uh, negotiate. No. He's going to say basically to all of us, I gave you the way. I redeemed you if you would come to me on my terms. And you decided to come to me with all this stuff about how you're basically a good person. No. What does the Bible say? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are what? Good people, go to church people, help others people. No, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The only redemption possible for the human beings of this world is through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. It, it's that way because Jesus is the only one God in the flesh, who came to earth, and he paid the price for our sin. He was punished on our behalf. Now, this is the basic gospel message, that if we receive him, God forgives us, God fills us with his spirit, God makes the substitution where the wrath of God against our sin is placed upon Christ on the cross. He's punished for our evil, and his righteousness is placed on us so that we are looked at by God through the righteousness of Christ. That's why we enter heaven. Not because we're good, but because through the mercy and grace of God in Jesus Christ, we have been allowed to enter his kingdom because we are covered with his righteousness. We're forgiven. Okay, so let's just stop that for a second and back up and take a broader look at the book of Galatians. Because there's a lot of preliminary things that might benefit you as we talk about it. First thing you need to think about is where, where is the audience for the book of Galatians? You know, when we, we talk about a church like Philippi, 
Well, you know, you can. the Philippian church was in a city. The Corinthian church was in Corinth. The Roman church was in Rome. This church, or this book, I should say, is written to Galatians. And this is a region. It's a region that contains the cities of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Lystra, and Derbe. You can read about it in Acts 13 and 14. Just to give you a little idea about where that is, you see Jerusalem here at the bottom of the screen. And as you go up the um, shore of the Mediterranean and turn left, you get into Asia Minor. It's pretty small up there, but uh, just below the Black Sea and like straight down from the Black Sea lettering there, you'll see a, a little word that says Galatia. And below that, in southern Galatia, you see these churches, Pisidian Antioch, and so forth. Okay, so Paul is writing this letter to a region, to a group of people in an area. This is often how New Testament truth is communicated. The letter gets written, and then the letter gets transferred or copied and sent down the line. This church reads it. Maybe they copy it. They send it to the next church. They send it to the next church. And each church reads the letter as they grow in their faith and learn about who God is as the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write the letter. So that's the region we're talking about. So when you think about the church of Galatia, it's not a church. They're the churches of Galatia because there's a whole series of cities that receive, probably I should say towns, that receive the truth of the letter written to the Galatians. Okay, just so you clear that up in your mind and have that understanding. This book is clearly identified as being written by the Apostle Paul. Now that's going to, uh, just for a little bunny trail, let's think about this. You know, the Apostle Paul had a very similar problem that the Galatians have. Uh, before he was saved. He has gone through all the machinations of Judaism. He's done everything he's been told to do. And he's got no peace. Instead of being somebody who loves God, what has Paul become? He's become a killer. He's become a persecutor. He is persecuting the church actively. Instead of serving this loving God by modeling the character of God, Paul is found in, in Acts chapter 7, 8, and 9. He's, he's doing his best to liquidate Christians, to imprison Christians, to stop Jesus at every turn. You remember in Acts chapter 9, Jesus knocks him down. From heaven, the light shines. Paul finds himself blinded on the dirt road as he lays there. And he says, who are you, Lord? Do you remember? Jesus says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. And it turns out that Paul changes. Paul becomes aware of the reality that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is God, and he does save if we come to him on his terms. Paul comes to Jesus. Paul is transformed. I mean, what other explanation could there be than a living Lord Jesus for the transformation Paul goes through? Just to talk about him for a second. Here's a guy who, who used to hate Christians. The persecutor now becomes the preacher. How can that be that, that there's such a dramatic transformation of heart if there isn't a reality behind it? What would cause a Christian hater to become a missionary spreading Christianity all over the known world except for an encounter with the living Christ, he learns that all his works, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, all the things he spent his life pursuing to be religious, he learns that those are totally worthless. Read Philippians 3 again and just understand it one more time. These things add up to nothing. These things take us nowhere. These religious um, ceremonies and rituals that we pursue to try to be good enough for God, they don't achieve the desired result. Instead, they leave us hopeless in our own despair. And that's really where Paul lived before he met Jesus Christ. 
So, we just look at this briefly now. We'll talk about it more in a minute. But this letter is clearly written by the Apostle Paul. There's a lot of debate about when it was written. Okay, but we're going to just, instead of pinning a date down when nobody actually knows the actual date, we're just going to say 49 to 54 BC, or AD, I'm sorry, somewhere in there. Okay, uh, the main thrust of the book of Galatians is found in this line here. It counters the Judaizers' heresies. Now, and what was a Judaizer? Just so you know, a Judaizer is somebody who says, okay, I'm willing to accept that Jesus is the Christ, but I'm also not willing to accept that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. In other words, where, where the Old Testament sacrificial system foreshadowed the shedding of innocent blood on behalf of the guilty so that the guilty could be forgiven, and then the cross completes that imagery in its fullness as Jesus himself dies as the Lamb of God, sacrificing innocent blood on behalf of the guilty, uh, the, the Judaizers aren't willing to stop there and say, we owe all our worship to Jesus. They want to tie us back to Old Testament law. Specifically, one of the main issues was this. Hey, you know, the Old Testament tells us that if we're going to be acceptable to God, and oh, by the way, the Judaizers were very adept at their rule keeping, at least in their hearts. That's what they wanted to do. Although none of us keeps the rules perfectly, and that's that's really a problem for them and us as well. It shows us we'll never be good enough for God in our own strength. But the Judaizers said, look, in the Old Testament, Abraham was given the covenant of circumcision, and we want to maintain that. We want to pursue that. Anybody who comes to Christ we need to force them to be circumcised. We need to force them to learn the laws and the traditions like we've learned them. We need to make sure that they fulfill these Old Testament requirements. Where the New Testament clearly will say, Christ fulfills these things. Christ fulfills the Old Testament and that our allegiance, our worship, our glory is in Christ and that our salvation is not attained through our own efforts. Our salvation is attained through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, Paul, he's been to these Galatian churches. He's ministered. He's preached the gospel. There's been churches established in each of these little towns. Um, but somehow, people have come in to bring destructive heresies. People have come in to say, Basically, Jesus' work on the cross is not enough. You can't be saved unless you add to Jesus' work on the cross through circumcision, through keeping various rituals. You need to be a good Jew while, you be, while you're a Christian. It's, it's phenomenally wrong. It's a different gospel. And we're going to hear Paul get so strong, it, it might shock you at how how adamantly he defends the gospel against these Judaizers. So we'll be looking for that as we go through the letter. As well, I want you to just think about this. This is the only letter Paul writes, the letter to this Galatian region. This is the only letter he writes that has no commendation. Remember when we went through Philippians? Philippians, Paul is talking so warmly to that body of believers about how he supports them, they support him, they have this intimate fellowship where they're brothers and sisters in Christ and they're united and he's encouraging them, telling them to rejoice all the time. In Galatians, you have none of that. You have correction. You have strong language that's telling somebody, get back on track. And just to tell you a little bit more about the book, let's, let's think about it. a few other things. It's a corrective letter. It's a letter that's saying, you guys are going this way, and the gospel would take you that way. You have lost your way. You need to consider your life. It's a very relevant passage or letter for our modern day, because many of us have our own concepts of how we can be good enough for God. We've abandoned what the gospel is to add to it whatever we decide we want to emphasize in our own lives, whether it be um, 
keeping rules, keeping rituals, doing the things that, you know, for instance, a monk, what do they decide? A nun, what do they decide? Well, the only way to please God and to be acceptable to God is to be sequestered, to get away from the world, to live in silence, to to live a life that, <clears throat> you know, you can't really sin when you sit by yourself in your room all day. At least that's their thought. But in the end, that silence and that, that isolation has no impact on keeping the sinful nature at bay. It doesn't transform the heart. Again, Galatian churches have gotten off track, and Paul is here to correct them. Uh, if you think about the structure of the book, just recall this. Chapters 1 and 2, Paul is really basically going to be defending his authority. And the reason he needs to do that is because people have come in from outside of the Galatian region, and they have declared Paul to be not good enough. They have declared Paul to be too simplistic in his presentation. They're going to teach the Galatian churches the right way, and they're going to add to what Paul has already said. Paul has to defend his authority. He has to show them that his gospel isn't something he made up. He's, he's, he's received it directly from God himself, and he's going to deliver it to them exactly as God has delivered it to him. This is very important, and we'll see that more as we go forward. Chapters 3 and 4, he basically lays out the gospel in detail and basically continues to push forward the truth that we're saved by grace, we're not saved by law. Critical distinction, a critical, in fact, Christianity is the only religion in the world that brings God to us instead of trying to bring us to God. God comes in the form of Jesus Christ. God dies for the sins of the world. We are regenerated, born again through faith in the Lamb of God, through faith in Jesus, not by works. Three and four are going to spell that out dramatically well. Chapters five and six talk about how we live this out. Now that we are in Christ and full of his spirit, how do we live it out? Jesus' followers, they live in grace. The theme here is about freedom. And, and you'll read a lot about freedom and bondage in the book of Galatians as we go through. But Galatians declares freedom in Christ. We're free from the law. Why? Because the law can't save us. We can't be good enough through our own effort. And by faith in Jesus Christ, we've been set free from the law. And I just to give you a little history, it's the book of Galatians that basically kicked off the Reformation through a man named Martin Luther. I assume you know who he is in history. If you don't, just let me help you a little bit. I think it was 1517, you had this monk in Wittenberg, Germany, who... Uh, his name Martin Luther. Well, Martin Luther is trying to be, trying to be a wonderful follower of God. He's doing everything he can to live in a way that would earn God's favor. I mean, Martin Luther would confess his sins to the priest for four, five, six hours every day. He he was almost neurotically obsessed with the judgment of God. To say that Martin Luther feared God would be an understatement. He was absolutely terrified of the judgment of God against sin, knowing that he himself was a sinner. I mean, he, he did things in his life that were just phenomenally submissive. He, he would isolate himself as a monk. He would, he, I think he even walked all the way to Rome one year. Uh, 800 miles he walked to try to serve his penance. To, and he went to the Roman church, and what did he see? He saw corruption like he'd never seen before. And what happened to Martin Luther? Well, I guess I should back up a second. Well, no, it's okay. Let's look at it this way. Martin Luther started studying Galatians, and he got to Galatians 3.11. And when he got to Galatians 3.11, his life changed. Let me just show it to you. It says this, 
Now it is evident that no one is justified. In other words, no one is made right before God by the law. This is what the text tells us. And when Martin Luther read this, it was like God opened his eyes. All these things I'm trying to accomplish to be good enough for God have no value. I cannot be justified before God by rule keeping. For the righteous, in other words, those that have been made right with God and justified before God, the righteous shall live how? Life comes to us, God's life enters us by faith. We place our faith in Jesus Christ. So when Martin Luther understood, when his eyes opened and he saw that salvation comes through faith, not through works, he wrote 20 things down and nailed them to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, the Wittenberg door it's called. He started the Reformation and just so you understand, you know there's Catholicism and Catholics, and there's Protestantism um, and, and the reason they're called Protestantism is it's called Protestantism is because of what Martin Luther did. He protested the theology that the Catholic Church was promulgating upon the people. He protested it by nailing these 20 things to the Wittenberg door and he ended up basically being persecuted by the Catholic Church to a tremendous degree because he was telling everybody that salvation is not through law. Salvation is not through trying to be good enough. Salvation is impossible through trying to be good enough. Know that the scripture declares so clearly that salvation is only available to those who come <clears throat> to Jesus Christ through faith. That's where salvation is found. So um, Martin Luther suffers tremendously, but it's this very passage that brings him to an understanding of what it is that God requires, what it is that God wants. Now, just to bring you to another person in the Bible who has this very same problem, I bring you to the Apostle Paul. As we spoke of a minute ago, the Apostle Paul had every conceivable religious credential in Judaism that could be had. Do you remember? Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul saying what? I am a fantastic rule keeper. I know how to do this. Even though somewhere deep inside of Paul, despite all this zealous persecution and all these religious credentials, Paul understands he's not okay with God. He understands that this has led him nowhere. I'm sure when he steps back and looks at his life at this stage in his life, he sees himself as what happened to me? I'm, I'm out here murdering people. I'm out here imprisoning people. And I'm telling people I'm serving God. I mean, he, he's got to feel the tension of, of understanding that, you know, here's the scripture before me, but as I live it out in my own strength and I try to be good enough for God, I am making no progress at all. And that's why when he writes to the Roman church, what does he say? He says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul says, wait a minute. The law isn't meant to make me perfect. The law is meant to show me that I'm not perfect, that I can't keep the law. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Paul himself has gone through this big transformation. God has reached out to him. He has surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. This hater of the church has now become the lover of the church, the missionary of the church. And he's out there telling people salvation isn't about being good enough. It's such a, a modern day problem. Go ahead, go down the street today and ask, ask 10 people, hey, do you think you're a, very, a pretty good person? I think you'll go 10 for 10 most of the time. People say, yeah, I'm basically a pretty good person. And what they mean is, 
I'm better than most. At least by the people I measure myself next to, I'm pretty good. In other words, that leads them to say, well then, I, I'm going to be acceptable to God because my pretty goodness is pretty much better than most other people's pretty good. And so uh, God's going to, when he measures us all out in the spectrum of who's pretty good and who's not, I should, I should easily enter his kingdom. I should appease him by my pretty goodness. It's such a lie of the devil. It's such a deception. We are not going to heaven because we're pretty good. No, for by works of the law, that's doing the right thing. That's, that's being a good person. By the works of the law, no human being will be justified. This is the clear declaration of Scripture. It's impossible to be saved by being good enough. I have a Catholic friend. I love him dearly. But I see him every time there's an opportunity for him to do something for somebody else. He's on it. Now that's great. It's great to love your neighbor. But when you're motivated by God's going to like me more if I sacrifice my time and my life to help these other people, then you're out of, out of line. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified. If you want to love your neighbor as yourself and you're going to help them because out of love of Christ you're going to serve your neighbor, that's great. Because you understand your salvation doesn't depend on your own effort. But when you put your own effort into the mix and say, I'm going to serve my neighbor because I need God to like me, <laughs> you've missed the essence of the gospel. Again, in Romans, Paul makes it clear, and I want you to see this as well. For we hold that no, that one is justified by faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the critical issue in the Galatian church. It's a critical issue for us today. It was a critical issue in the Roman church, as Paul wrote to the church at Rome here in 328. In the end, we have to really step back and say to ourselves, are we believing what God has said? Or are we adding to what God has said or subtracting from what God has said to appease ourselves? The quest you and I are on is to look at the declaration God has made as he's revealed himself in his book and say, am I believing what's true as revealed by God? Or am I living in deception? Deception means you've been taken to a place where you're believing a lie. It, it means that despite your good intention, when you come before God on Judgment Day, you'll be revealed as somebody who refused to come to Christ on his terms and therefore you'll be judged by God. So it's critical. It's critical, church, that you and I look at this and understand it well. Let's go to the passage. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Remember I said that Paul's first quest in this was going to be to um, declare himself and to exercise his authority in the sense that he was going to defend himself. Here we go. Watch this. Paul, an apostle. What does that mean? I'm a sent out one. I've been sent here by God. Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Here he is. He's addressing the Galatian churches by telling them directly, Look, I am not here because I needed something to do today. I'm here because God sent me here. And it's God himself that sent me here. I am not here because I think it's a good idea. I'm here because God the Father sent me. I'm here because Jesus Christ sent me. And I'm here because God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. As the great exclamation point to the truth of Jesus being the Christ, I have, I have met him. I know Jesus is alive now. I have authority from God to address you. I have authority from God to deliver the truth to you. This is Paul's understanding of himself in Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, and we'll see that develop throughout the book. And he adds to that, not only am I writing to you, churches of Galatia, um, I, all the brothers who are with me, 
I'm writing to you as well. They're with me. And we're writing to the churches. There it is. The churches, the plural of Galatia. You see that he's writing to a region, not just to a particular one place kind of church. Now he says this. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a formal greeting. It's a typical greeting. It's found in many of the letters. But again, we're offering you grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. God's going to love you not because you deserve it, but because he is gracious. Grace to you. God's going to give you peace. Not because you deserve it, because you're a pretty good person, or you've kept the rules, or in Paul's situation, because you've been circumcised and you've been uh, dabbling in Judaism enough that God's going to like you. No. God's grace is the reason you'll have peace. He gives you what you don't deserve, and you have peace. And it comes from where? From God our Father. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't come from your effort to be good enough. You're set free from the bondage of sin, and you're set free from the bondage of the law when you come to Jesus Christ because of the grace of God. And now Paul delivers his first explanation of what the gospel is. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus Christ came as a substitutionary death for us. He came as the Lamb of God. He came to die on our behalf. He gave himself for our sins. And what did that accomplish? It delivered us from the present evil age. Through this substitution, as we've talked, Jesus places his righteousness on us when we come to him by faith and we are made righteous because we've received the living Lord Jesus Christ. And this is according to the will. This is what God wants, the will of our God and Father. This is God's plan of salvation. These are God's terms. Paul adds in verse 5, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God deserves his glory and his praise and his adoration because he has made a way for us to escape his wrath. He has brought us to a place that through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be redeemed. It is his will that we come to him in this way. This is what he wants. He draws us to himself. He makes it possible. How could we possibly think that what God has done to save us is not enough? We have to add to it with our own structure of ideas that we think God would probably like this too, so we're going to impose these things on ourselves. No, Paul keeps advocating for freedom in this letter. You'll see it over and over. And he gives glory to God for saving us. And then we take a turn. Paul begins his correction. I am astonished. In other words, you guys have surprised me beyond measure. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him. Who? Deserting God, deserting Christ. You are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And you're turning to a different gospel. Now this is another critical moment in the letter. You need to understand that to believe not all the truth or to believe the perversion of the truth is to desert God is to abandon God, to leave God behind, to follow what you think is right. I am so astonished that you're quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. You're turning to a different gospel, and we're going to pick it up here next time, but just to give you the flavor of it, I want you to see this before we go. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. These are the Judaizers we talked about. Notice in 1-7, there is not another gospel. There is one. God didn't make a mistake when he wrote his word. He understands what he wants to say. He says it with authority, and we have the choice of believing it or not, but that we dare not add to it or subtract from it. God has given us his way. We need to follow him.
there is not another gospel. Even though some people are showing up among you trying to distort the gospel of Christ, and now Paul gets really strong. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. This is like a word, let him be damned. Let him go to hell. There is, there is no other gospel. I don't care if I get deluded in my own thinking and start preaching something different. I don't care if an angel from heaven comes and starts telling you some different way to God. If, we, if you haven't believed what we told you in, as the truth about salvation, then, you know, whoever's doing that to you needs to be sent to hell, straight to hell. And as we have said before, now I say again, to emphasize this correction and to emphasize the truth, he says it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Next time when we gather, we're going to talk about what it means to have one gospel, one way. I know that many in our culture today would tell us we're intolerant, but Jesus would tell us, preach the truth in love. Preach the truth in love because this is the only way the soul can be transformed by the power of God. There is no work that can happen that would transform a heart. It's the work of the Spirit as we yield ourselves to Christ. So if you're watching this today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, understand the Bible says so clearly that it's only through Christ that salvation exists and that Jesus died to take our evil upon himself, to pay the penalty of death himself on our behalf, and that God recognizes the sacrifice of Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus sits as the second member of the Trinity on the right hand of God. He is alive today. We serve him. We love him. He tells us, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. That's our quest in life. If you don't know him, if you're believing that you can earn your way to heaven through your good works, today is the day of salvation for you. Repent. Apologize to God and turn from evil and put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the call. That's the call. I trust you get a lot out of this. Uh, this will be available online uh, for you to share with your friends and neighbors if, if you know that they're trapped in this bondage of trying to be good enough for God. We'll talk a lot more about it as this study of Galatians continues. Church, I praise God for you. Until we meet again, I pray you serve him well.